How's it going everybody? In this video we're going to go through and do a basic setup for getting the vSphere networking set up and iSCSI configuration rolling. Actually I had a catastrophic failure the other day and I ended up having to reinstall um, ESXi. So um, as you can see this looks like a pretty much a brand new server. Technically it, it it's the same box I've been using for the past, I don't know, year. It's the video, uh, the same server that I've used to create a bunch of videos and whatnot, but um, catastrophic failure happened. The, the thing with that, though, is the hard drives that I was using, um, I was using to save all of the VMs on, were iSCSI created. So nothing on the local drive was lost. Uh, so... I didn't save any of the VMDKs to the local storage of the server. It was all via the, the iSCSI connectivity. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to walk you guys through a basic installation of how that would work. And it's not super complicated. It's just that you have to understand the pieces to it. I've talked... <coughs> excuse me. I've made reference to this several times in the past, but you've never actually seen me walk through a full uh, imp implementation of this. So to set it up is actually very, very simple. The first thing we need to do here is create a V switch that is going to allow us to separate the traffic. And now I could technically put this into um, regular uh, management and production traffic, but I decided against doing that. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this Add Networking tab here, and I'm going to create a VM uh, VM kernel adapter. And I'm going to click Next. And the thing you have to do is you have to find the adapter. <coughs> the adapter that gives you the gigabit connectivity which happens to be VMK uh, VMNIC9 so I'm, attempting, I'm, I'm attaching VMNIC9 to this new vSwitch and it's created a vSphere standard switch VMNIC9 is going to be mapped to it and it's got the 1012 address because it knows that the remote end of it so the iSCSI target is going to be set up correctly so I'm going to go ahead and click on next and I'm going to come over here and this is going to be SAN pretty simple stuff and this is not going to be for vMotion, fault tolerance or management traffic. Straightforward configuration. I'm going to click next but I have to give it an IP address which is going to be 10.1.2.3 and it's going to be a slash 24 mask. And that's it. That's all there really is for the networking. I'm going to click on next and finish. So now this guy's created, right? So now the next thing is, is I'm going to bring up my remote desktop connection to my iSCSI array and I'm going to ping this box to, to just to prove that I have at least layer 3 connectivity. So as you can see I've pulled up my um, configuration here of StarWind software which is what I use to connect all these devices together. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to come in here and ping 10.1.2.3 and I can ping it as you can see. That means I that this computer can ping the iSCSI uh, software adapter on the other computer, which is what I'm looking for. So now with that being done, I'm going to come over here and I'm going to minimize this guy. Now what we have to do is we have to set up the storage adapter. So we're going to click on storage adapters. Now I happen to have, I don't have a storage adapter created yet. I'm going to go ahead and click on add. I'm going to select add software's iSCSI adapter. I'm going to click OK. It's, yeah, I'm accepting that configuration. Now the adapter is in play. I click on this guy, I right click and I go to properties. I'm going to go down to network configuration. From network configuration I need to do a VM kernel port binding. What that means is I need to bind the VM kernel adapter that I just created to this uh, and that particular V switch to the iSCSI port. So I have to map the software adapter to the actual VM kernel adapter so that it knows how to talk to each other. I'm going to click add. Now I've got two in here. I have SAN. This is now this is the the V switch that I just created and the SAN VM kernel adapter that I just created, right? So the things you just saw me put into play just a moment ago. And it's got the right address. It's 10.1.2.3/24. Everything's good to go. It's a gigabit connection, which is what I need. I'm going to click on okay. It's compliant and we're good to go. So now the next step is now that we've added a a port group binding, we need to go down to dynamic discovery. I'm going to click on Add, and I'm going to type in the iSCSI address, which is 192, or I'm sorry, it is 10.1.2.150. 3260 is the port. That's what the server is listening for. 
what uh, the client is 3261. So the iSCSI, uh, the ESXi host is the client of the iSCSI um, storage. I'm going to click on OK. It goes out there and it finds it. I click on close. Now it says the rescan of the host bus adapter is recommended for this configuration uh, change. Rescan the, uh, the adapter. I'm going to click yes. Now it is actually going down. It's doing a call out to the storage and that's in progress. Now if everything is set up correctly and everything's working on the iSCSI side, I should get three drives that show up. Each one is going to be 500 gigs. And it does. Each one's 500 gigs. Now, now that I've done that, I've set up the storage adapters. Now I need to click over here on the storage. Now you'll see that I have SAN 3. This guy is uh, ready to go. I need to go to add storage. And it's going to be disk or alone because it's going to be iSCSI uh, traffic. I'm going to click next. And you see how these guys show up. We have LUN 0. We're going to click on this guy. I'm going to click on next. I'm going to keep the existing signature because these were already in place disks and drives. I don't want to blow anything away. I'm going to click on oh, next and finish. So that brings in that drive. So SAN 2 and SAN 1, or SAN 2 and SAN 3. Now, mind you, because of the fact that these were already existing drives, I'm just reallocating the storage to the box. I'm going to add storage one more time. Disk or LUN. I'm going to click on next, grab the drive, click on next. Now, if this was a new drive, you would simply follow the, the, the prompts to do, I would do all the defaults and be done. Click next and finish. And then there you go. I mean, it's, it's just that simple. Now, for those of you that haven't seen this done before, if we pull up this guy, we minimize him. I'm curious to see, can we add a device? Let's see if I can add, add a hard disk. Next, virtual disk. I'm going to give it, um, I'll give it 100 gigs. I'm going to go ahead and click next. Thick provision is fine. Okay, it was able to do it, so I did that. So now we have another disk. We have this 100 gig file right here, image file 2. I'm going to come back over here to my my drive and I'm going to click back on the storage adapter and I'm going to and there it is right there. The 100 gig is right there. So I'm going to go back to storage. I'm going to go ahead and click on Add Storage, Disk or LUN. It sees the 100 gig drive. I'm going to click on Next. I'm going to click Next again. And this is where you need to enter a data store name, which is going to be SAN4. I wanted to show you a, uh, a brand new implementation. So I'm going to click on Next. I'm going to use the maximum available space. Click Next. And then that's it. It's actually in the process of going in and it's going to format it as VMFS5. It's got 98 gigs available. And that's it. I mean, right now, if we were to click on the um, the summary tab here, um, we have all these different drives. Now, you might uh, the one thing that's over here that's a little weird though is none none of my virtual machines are showing up. Now, how would you recover those? You know, you've already created a bunch of hard drives, or you've already created a bunch of virtual machines. You had some catastrophic failure. How do you recover those? Well, the easy way to do that would be to go into each data store. Go to Browse Data Store, and you have all these different VMs here. If I was to click inside of here, and uh, actually let me take that take that step back. So click on the data store itself, highlight it, right click and go Browse Data Store. Then what you're going to do is you're going to go put them in order of name. So say for instance ACS. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to double click inside of there. If you look down right here, which is this ACS.vmx, which is the virtual machine configuration file, if you right click select that drive and select that file right click and go to add inventory add to inventory it's going to say ACS because you can you can change the name click next on that host click next and finish ACS will show up right there and just repeat the process so as you can see it's actually very very easy to get uh, this operational so again if you didn't get what I was uh, trying to bring the inventory in now, if you have a lot of virtual machines and they are, don't show up here, browse data store, find the VMs, and then you know go in here and then just right click and add to inventory. And you have to do this on a per VM basis, um, as far as I'm aware. There's no way to uh, to do that other other than that. Now, there is a question: What about vMotion and some other things if you have a cluster? Now, normally what would end up happening is, and this assumes that you have some sort of high availability uh, capability in place. 
And what I mean by that is, and let me go ahead and ex explain quickly what I mean by this, because there's a uh, I don't want to make people think that this is like, you know, you have no choice in this because you uh, you actually do. It's just, uh, give me one second here to fire up my, I have some screen capture software that I'm going to get ready to go. And so the idea is like this. So on a per virtual machine basis, what we need to do is we need to come, we need to go in here and, um, so let me grab my pen here or my, uh, my mouse. So on a per virtual machine basis, we have to come in here and we have to add these VMs back to the inventory. Now, um, if you happen to have a cluster, and I'll, cut, I'll touch on another thing here in a moment. If you happen to have all these in a cluster where you have two or more uh, ESXi hosts together, if you have any type of HA or DRS enabled to where you can have uh, HA being if you have a virtual machine on a host, you can, uh, if that physical host that that virtual machine resides on, if that host fails, you can have HA take that virtual machine and copy it over to the other host and restart it. Now, this would help alleviate what I have to do here. So, if you have a vCenter environment with HA set up, the, you don't have to do this because the VM would already be running. You just have to get the other, the, uh, the fail host back up. Now, that's... I have to spend some time, and it's not going to take me long to do this, you know. I mean, there are a lot of virtual machines, but a lot of this stuff I can get rid of because I'm not using everything. So a lot of this stuff is going to be pretty straightforward for me to get operational. Fortunately for me, most of these, most of these VMs sit on one, uh, inside of one uh, SAN LUN. So the other one to do is if you, um, if, for instance, the host itself, if the host itself goes down, or let's say, for instance, you go out and... Um, what I'm able to do is I can do some voodoo magic on the back end and you're able to reset the license every 60 days without having to, um, uh, to completely reinstall the operating system and or the, the hypervisor. Now, by doing that, you're able to go in there and you don't actually lose the connectivity. So the, the virtual machines don't disappear. So by doing that, they stay in play here, but because the virtual machine hard drives are sitting on a remote data store, not local to the host, then you can just go ahead and when the, uh, the host reboots, you can go ahead and um, all these guys will show up as um, inaccessible because of the fact that the iSCSI connectivity mappings aren't there. Once you get the iSCSI connectivity mappings back in place, you can go ahead and uh, it'll as soon as it finds the its file, it'll automatically be able to spin the virtual machine back up, or at least it'll show up like it is over here. So I'll have to take a few minutes and go through this. I'm gonna I'm not gonna make you guys wait for that, but that is one capability that is nice about uh, remote data storage. So again, if you have a data store, <coughs> excuse me, if you have, so if you. I forgot where I was going with that. I got interrupted. So if you um, have a cluster, two or more hosts, you can just simply move, bring the host back up and then move everything over once it's all said and done. That's the most ideal situation. This way you're not, you're not having to deal with this, but if you have the unfortunate piece where you have to go in there and um, uh, go in here on a per VM basis and do this, you know, it is what it is and you know just move forward with that um it's not going to take me too long to get this running but you know it kind of stinks in that regard but you know so be it that's what happens when you do this type of work so anyway that's pretty much what i wanted to cover with you guys i hope that this has been informative for you and i would like to thank you for viewing